Uh, the dollar is up on the year, but it's losing those gains rapidly. But I think over the next several years, we're going to see a very weak dollar as the markets come to terms with the re reality that inflation is not only going to get higher, but it's here to stay. It's not going back down to 2%. And mm. that's going to result in a run on the dollar, I think, and on U.S. dollar denominated assets, especially when the Federal Reserve actually has to go back to quantitative easing, which is creating more inflation because the economy gets so bad that it actually turns into a financial crisis. By now, quite a few celebrities, including Elon Musk and Susie Orman, have predicted a recession would hit the U.S. economy. Peter Schiff, the CEO and chief global strategist at Euro Pacific Capital, is the latest expert to sound the alarm. Anyone thinking this recession will be mild doesn't understand recessions, he said. The longer interest rates are held too low during a boom, the more mistake must be corrected during a bust. Since rates have never been so low for so long, this recession will be the most severe yet. It's dawning on many investors that our post-COVID financial problems may not be as easily solved as Washington claims. While most people generally understand that the stock market and the economy do not move in lockstep, there is still an underlying belief that a strong market reflects a strong economy. But according to that logic, our current economy must be historically strong. If this strikes you as strange, given that we are amid a destabilizing and polarizing pandemic and a period of political risk that threatens the foundations of the republic, that's just because you don't understand how the fundamental relationship between the stock market and the economy has changed. Some tried to downplay concern by pointing out that the gains resulted from the base effect of comparing current prices with the artificially depressed COVID lockdown prices of March and April of last year. But that ignores the more alarming trend of near-term price acceleration. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, every month this year, the month-over-month -month change in prices has been greater than the change in the previous month. Despite Federal Reserve officials' recent assurances that the inflation problem is transitory, many investors are concluding that the central bank will have to deal with this problem by tightening monetary policy far sooner than had been expected. This would make sense if the Fed cared about restraining inflation or, more importantly, had the power to do anything to stop it. In truth, we are sailing into these waters with little ability to alter speed or course, and we will be wholly at the mercy of the waves we have spent a generation creating. Let us join Peter Schiff in this video and listen as he breaks down the economic outlook. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe and turn on notifications. The rate increases that you're talking about are partially responsible for that recession. I think the recession is going to get a lot worse. Now, that doesn't mean the Fed shouldn't be raising rates. They should be. They should already have raised them a lot more than they have. The problem mm -hmm. was they never should have cut them. That was the mistake. Yeah. It was cutting rates. Raising them back up is really just an acknowledgement of that mistake. But what happens is when the Fed raises rates, it uncovers all of the problems that it created when it reduced rates. Because when it slashed interest rates to zero, it inflated a bubble economy. And it inflated it with inflation. Quantitative easing was inflation. It's just another word to describe inflation. It, it's just that a lot of people don't realize that it is inflation because inflation has a bad connotation to it. And so uh, quantitative easing uh, doesn't sound as bad. If the Fed said our policy is to create inflation, the public would have said, wait a minute, I don't want inflation. So if they say, well, mm -hmm. our policy is quantitative easing, then you don't have as many uh, people critical of the policy, but we're now experiencing the consequences of that inflation, rising prices, and prices still have a long way to go. And that's one of the reasons I think that the recession is going to get a lot worse because more consumer income is going to be diverted uh, to necessities like food, energy, rent, insurance, things like that. And interest rates are going to have to keep rising. And that's also going to take a lot of purchasing power out of the economy because people have to service their debt. And if you're spending money paying interest on the money you borrowed to buy stuff in the past, you have less money left over to buy stuff in the present and in the future. And that's what helps bring about a more severe recession. Most people's stock portfolios are going to continue to fall. Most people who own stocks, unfortunately, own the most overvalued stocks. Uh, big tech, for example, those are the stocks that went up the most because interest rates were zero and people thought that inflation would be low forever. Well, now that interest rates are not zero and inflation is here and getting worse, 
those stock valuations are coming down. I think they still have a long way to fall. So most people will lose money in the stock market. I think they'll fare even worse in the bond market. Uh, even though yields are higher now on bonds, they're not nearly high enough to offset inflation. So people are going to lose a lot in bonds. So they have to start thinking outside the box and look towards alternative types of investing. You can still invest in stocks, but you can't invest in the indexes uh, that are so dominated by overpriced tech names. You have to you know, be you know, more discriminating in the stocks you buy. You have to select the stocks based on value and dividend yield and just build your own portfolio rather than just you know, buying these indexes. And I think the best values are, are had abroad. I think the, the, the highest dividend yields are outside the US. And I think that also gives you the benefit of a hedge against what I believe is gonna be a very weak US dollar. Uh, the dollar is up on the year, but it's losing those gains rapidly. But I think over the next several years, we're gonna see a very weak dollar as the markets come to terms with the re reality that inflation is not only going to get higher, but it's here to stay. It's not going back down to 2%. And mm. that's going to result in a run on the dollar, I think, and on U.S. dollar-denominated assets, especially when the Federal Reserve actually has to go back to quantitative easing, which is creating more inflation because the economy gets so bad that it actually turns into a financial crisis. And now the Fed is under a lot of pressure to try to stimulate the economy. But the only way it can do that is by creating even more inflation. Right from the onset, Peter has always dished out warnings about the state of the economy. According to Shift 4 Years, I have been warning that during the age of permanent stimulus, which began in earnest with the Federal Reserve's reaction to the dot-com crash of 2000, each successive economic contraction would have to be met with ever larger, increasingly ineffective, doses of monetary and fiscal stimulus to keep the economy from spiraling into depression. I have also said that the enormity of the asset price gains over the last 10 years had increased the danger because reflating the bloated stock, real estate, and public and private debt markets would bring on doses of stimulus that could prove lethal for the economy. Well, first of all, just to point to the jobs that are being lost, these are full-time jobs, high-paying jobs with benefits. The jobs that we're creating are part-time jobs with low pay and no benefits. So. It's not, you know, I, I can even trade off when you look at the jobs we're losing and the jobs that are being created to replace those lost jobs. But I think this is just early in the, the layoffs. I think the layoffs are going to be very widespread. And in fact, some companies are going to be laying off 100 percent of their workforce because they're going to be going bankrupt. But a lot of companies are going to be laying off a lot of workers to avoid going bankrupt because they have to start cutting their costs. And one of the costs that they can cut is labor. And so when you cut your labor, you have to eliminate employer employees. And the reason for this is that companies' real sales are going down because their customers are broke. So they can't afford to buy as many products. And so the companies selling those products or services don't need as many workers uh, to help uh, provide those goods and services. And employers are looking at higher interest rates if they've borrowed money which a lot of employers have borrowed money uh, to uh, buy capital equipment that they might need. Their rent might be going up on their office space and their other raw material costs are rising. And so they have to figure out how to get by because businesses need to generate a profit because that's the way the owners of the business uh, make money off the business. And if they don't have a profit, they have to figure out how to create one or they're going to go out of business. And so one way would be to scale back the, the size of the business, and that means uh, reducing your headcount. And that's going to go on across the economy. And of course, there are a lot of companies that never should have been created in the first place, that only were created as a consequence of monetary policy, of cheap money and the casino-like environment that the Fed created in the stock market. You have a lot of companies that have never made any money, but they have a lot like of what? employees. How were they Here's able to example. pay these employees if they had no money to pay them with? Well, they were selling stocks to investors and they were using that money uh, to pay their workers. But if the appetite for shares of money losing companies is no longer there, 
a lot of these companies aren't going to be able to stay in business. And to the extent that they can stay in business, it will only be if they can dramatically downsize their operations and start generating a profit. And that probably means they have to eliminate most of their workforce. Well, a lot of these social media type companies or tech companies or, you know, last year, I think we had a record in money losing companies that went public. I mean, normally you wouldn't go public until you had been able to prove the viability of your company, that you're a profitable company and you just want to get more money so that you can scale it up. But you had all these companies that never proved anything other than the fact that they can lose money and they went public. And I think a lot of these companies are going to go from IPO to bankruptcy in a relatively short period of time. Mm. For countries that issue currencies that are not the world's reserve, that is every country but the U.S., the playbook is radically different. Down in the cheap seats, politicians are aware that the costs of trying to print your way out of a financial dead end are likely to be higher than the temporary gain of immediate liquidity injections. Blatant debt monetization, whereby a government sells newly created bonds to its central bank, usually ends in rampant, or even hyper, inflation, which wipes out the savings and the economic viability of the nation. But the dollar sits at the center of the global financial system, creating a built-in demand, as most cross-border transactions need dollars to execute. Peter believes we are on a dangerous path to a massive disaster and very little can be done to escape that path. What do you think you can do to save yourself? Let us know in the comment section below. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe and turn on notifications. Thanks for watching.